Welcome back to Factory Sealed. It is May the 3rd, 2015. God, that was enthusiastic. <laughs> I'm trying to compensate for my cold. Nearly shit myself. <laughs> Did you? Oh, that's right. You guys can't hear the music. No. no. Just all of a sudden, just, <laughs> welcome! <laughs> I'll try to tone it Jesus down. Jesus Christ. Oh, my heart's going like crazy. <laughs> it was a little loud, wasn't it? Mm. There we go. Anyway, my name's Eric Peterson. Joining me today is Jess Clarkson. Yes. She's back. I am. And once again, he is now considered a regular Mr. Daniel Curtis. Oh, wow. A regular. Yeah, you've made it That's to fantastic. three. Hey, everyone. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, you've apparently been. somebody only made it to one. So compared to him, I'm doing well. I don't know if I would consider that to be a... I don't know if he was ever a part of the show. You're talking, you're talking about on, Toronto was... Batman, right? Oh, shut what? up. <laughs> Over it. <laughs> there's, a ba- there's a Batman in Toronto. Dan, you never listened to the Toronto Batman episode? No. no. Don't ever, please. <laughs> that is the black mark on the history of Factory Sealed. It's terrible. And it's okay. my fault. Yeah, it <laughs> is Jess's fault, which is why I'm very hesitant to except guests from Jess again. Because she talked up Toronto Batman for the longest time. But in all honesty, she did have a really good track record prior. She had landed Elias to Fexus, and he was on, and then she's like, all right, guys, hey, I got Toronto Batman. I'm like, all right. I mean, she came in with Elias. We can only go up, I thought, but I guess it's the other way around, because Elias is kind of the top. So it's like, we're going down from here. Well, also... Um, who else? The guy from Call of Duty? James Wood. No, James Brown? J- Burn? James Burn. Hasn't, hasn't, <laughs> hasn't everybody been in Call of Duty at this point? But I'm just saying. Two or three. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, so I'm actually in the star and role for Call of Duty this year. So, yeah. The angry Brit. He was yeah. on Mana Tank, though, wasn't he? Yes, yeah, so. but still my doing. Oh. Still taking credit for that. Well, and we had so, David we Hayter. We still Manatank or what? Yeah. No, we are not. Oh. Manatank is an umbrella over... It's it's almost like a podcasting network that it's going to expand into. Right now, Factory Sealed exists on its own in conjunction with Talking Reckless under the Manatank umbrella. Oh, that sounds technical. Yeah. Yeah, good. What episode is this? 48? Yeah. 48. Oh my god. We gotta come up with something awesome for episode 50. Any ideas? No, none. Oh dear. Could we get a special we'll guest? Suggestions. suggestions, people. Yeah, suggestions. Um, yeah, I have no idea, honestly. I feel like it needs to be a really iconic game with a guest and like fireworks and America, America, bald eagles riding in RVs, <laughs> grilling hot dogs. Yeah, let's just go on the streets of America and do it live. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I'd be fine with that. You guys can come here. I got a house. We could talk to the people of Arizona. Oh, that'll be a treat. Can we go to that restaurant? That restaurant, it thank you. Baking Company. Oh, yeah. That restaurant. She chases people out of her restaurant with a knife. I what? know. It would be so. What show fun. is that on, Jess? Kitchen Nightmares? Yeah. So there's a show that Gordon Ramsay does. You're familiar with him. He's an angry Brit. Um, he is, yes. There's a restaurant in Scottsdale here where this lady is Annie's Cafe or something. And. It was the only time that Gordon actually considered just walking off and leaving because she was her her style of service and management was so rude. She was chasing customers out of the store with cleavers. And she became a national <laughs> sensation. Like people travel from all over the country to go to her restaurant. And she's still they just as much people. of a bitch. 
Like wow. her and her is husband that... yell at people. She has crazy, crazy eyes. Yeah. I, th- I think it sounds like this woman's got issues. Quite. Apparently there's a restaurant in Japan, which is uh, like a prison. And uh, they chase you out of there with uh, things. There was done. a restaurant I saw in Japan that was all toilet based. Like you sit on toilets. They serve they you like the on... toilets over there. Yeah. They serve you on toilet tables. And then all of your oh. food comes in miniature toilets. Ew. I had a toilet lip gloss one time. I got it as a prize. A toilet I I lip like gloss? Dave and Buster's or something. Yeah. It was like a little plastic toilet that was on a keychain. Huh. And you opened well, the that, lid that and then lovely. there was a lip gloss. Was the lip gloss brown? No. Oh. It was white. They mi- That's a missed opportunity there right colors. there. Actually, I think I got a white one, and there are like other colors. I'm gonna find a picture of this. Yeah, that's a missed opportunity if it's not brown. Huh? Yeah, pictures. It's beautiful. Send it. Let's see it. Hmm. Oh. Bam. That's just. Disca- How would you even get your lips on that? <laughs> What the hell? No, you use your finger. Who uses their finger and then puts it on? I feel like that's one extra step that doesn't need to exist. No, they are there's the most so sparkly toilets in, like, in the world. Those stuff. Those look like gel. The the jelly sandals from the nineties. Yeah, those were sweet. Which seem to be I back in fashion this. in England. Oh, gross! Really? Really? Oh man! I would As really- our um. As are flashing trainers for kids, which I used to have. You mean flashing sneakers? No, trainers. Why would kids be training for anything? So why do you call them trainers? I don't know. Why do you call them sneakers? Do all the kids <laughs> sneak around? Yeah, we're in America. <laughs> well, they get murdered by crazy knife ladies. Or you could just call them shoes, like tennis shoes. Jesus Christ. Okay, shoes. <laughs> Is that your best American shoes? I wasn't even an attempt at an American accent. Shoes. Goddamn shoes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we got to put the, the link in the chat here. You want to see these? Here, I just put it in. If you want to see this uh, toilet lip gloss. What did you search so people listening can look it up, Jess? Um, toilet lip balm. That seems pretty <laughs> vague, but I guess you're only going to come up with one thing. It it's the first vague, image. not vag. Vague? Vague. Not fag. I didn't say that. I said vague. Yeah, vague. Yeah. Vague? It's not vague. It's vague. You're so weird. It's you. not a long A. It's vague. Yeah, it's vague, not vague. It's not vague. <laughs> what the heck? Is this is the same on? conversation I used to have when I was teaching English because my students thought I was saying fag. I'm like, no, I'm saying vague. Well, that's better. <laughs> it's with a V, not an F. Yeah, but it's uh, vague. So who's but right? I feel like all three of us are saying it improperly. I feel like I'm right. What are you saying? Vague. Yeah, so am I. Vague. No, you're not. You <laughs> say it wrong. <laughs> How am I saying it? You say it like, say fag. Okay, fag. Right, say it vague. Vague. <laughs> <laughs> There's no difference. The U is in there. Oh, God. Yeah, the, the U is after. I know Americans hate U's, and you just take them out of words, yeah. but... You don't need color. You don't need anur. <laughs> this is so vague. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Thank you. Do you remember when we had the big debate about herbs and herbs? Yes, because herb <laughs> is a name and herb is a spice. You say herb? It? Herb. herb. We're, playing Re- we're playing Red Dead Redemption and he just started talking about herbs and I was like, what the hell are herbs? <laughs> herb is oh. a name, like the owner of the Bucks and the creator of the Coles department store. Herb coal. But if you want to put some spice on your food, you put some herbs on there. But isn't there an H still at the front of yes, that word? Yes, but it's silent. 
No, it isn't. <laughs> yes, it is. I've never been so- that's like a French thing. Are you guys French? No, you guys are, and that's why I hate you. <laughs> Your country is backward. I'm going to search herb versus herb and see what comes up. God damn Americans. I think that's very vague. Uh, <laughs> vague. <laughs> vague. Vague. There you go. That's a good. That's the closest to sounding American I've ever heard you. Oh my goodness. Besides, you give me a gig damn hamburger. Cheeseburger, actually. Oh, sorry. You got to have that extra fat on there. Yeah. You'll get so used to this it. So is, this has is turned into the Factory Seal Grammar <laughs> podcast. Naturally, I used to teach grammar. And you still I don't, don't know how. Oh. Uh, all, the kids, all the kids are probably just wandering around Arizona going, Vag! Vag! <laughs> Well, get me some herbs. <laughs> Maybe that's why Amy's so angry at her restaurant. It's a it's a uh, accent thing. Where I come from in Wisconsin, there's a pretty thick Norwegian accent, and that's you just draw out your vowels like poop. Yeah, so you should sound more Canadian. No, I try not. There's a very fine line between. Awesome Norwegian and shitty Canadian. <laughs> Am I wrong? Is it the a boot? Yes, and the A's. That draws a lot. I met a Canadian guy outside a hockey game down here, and every sentence ended with A. He was the stereotypical Canadian guy, and every time he'd say A, he'd like hit me on the shore. He's like, oh, you excited to go to the game, eh? Eh? What do you think, eh? It's like, this guy's going to be really good, eh? <laughs> Every time. That's amazing. And the dude was just... He sounds like a bundle of fun. Hammered drunk. So much fun. I kind of wanted to sit de- uh, near him during the game. It would have been hilarious. Yes. How about this game, eh? Would've. What do you think of that, that ice there, eh? It's pretty cold, eh? <laughs> Came all the way down from Edmonton, eh? It's like, That's not a question. <laughs> it is a <laughs> statement. I think it's... Yeah, I don't use A very often, I don't think. I feel like you come from a more just... civilized part of Canada. Yeah, there, it's like tr- I feel like Toronto's accent is not very stereotypical. Let's get Canadian. Dan's input on this. Dan, Jess lives in Hello. a specific city <laughs> that starts with a T and ends with an O. How do you pronounce it? I'll type it in the chat box. Toronto. Thank you. It's Toronto. There's a T in there. It's not. It's not I a know, Disney but film. You just <laughs> you drop it. Now you, you understand. Disney. Toronto. Now you understand <laughs> my my rationale with herb. You can't no, sit here and tell me that I'm mispronouncing <laughs> Toronto when you're telling me I'm mispronouncing no, like, herb. Because Toronto there's a T in there. Is the proper way to say it, I think, in like a grammatically correct way, but Toronto. Is just the way that it's said. I feel like we have this argument every single episode. Toronto. Most likely. <laughs> Shut go back and <laughs> go back and listen to the Toronto Batman episode. He tells us exactly how to pronounce it. No. No. Dan, you have to listen oh, to that. Show. I have to listen to this immediately. It's terrible. No, you don't. I, I, I'm going to go for ten minutes and listen. Please don't. <laughs> No, I'm not. Please don't. It was one of those episodes where it's like, I don't know what's happening and I can't get control of it. <laughs> oh, dear. It's bad. So It's bad. Well, yeah, you, still up, you still uploaded it. I, hey, we had to. We couldn't go from... We couldn't skip one. You know, got to take the, the, the bad with the good. I got so many emails. Yeah. I'm surprised you didn't get death threats. <laughs> so that part, it's so Jesus bad, Christ. Dan. <laughs> on that note i have a really cool guest that we could... i don't know about this is it toronto <laughs> batman when he's not in his batman suit is it toronto robin that's... no that's a thing is it really yeah is he a sidekick i don't know Do you just have a, a dc superhero like every single one in in canada there's a spider-man so is, is too the... Is there a Toronto Wonder Woman? 
No. I saw a picture no. of this this guy yes, on. Get going. I saw this picture <laughs> of a guy <laughs> online who uh, uploaded a. He uploaded a picture of this really shittily dressed Batman. He looked like the 1960s Batman with like a, a foam muscle suit on. <laughs> the caption I just said, love the 60s Batman. Said, so apparently in my town, there's a guy dressed as Batman who responds and shows up to every single police call. <laughs> so he just dresses up. I mean, I can just imagine him driving around like a green Camry and just shows up and gets out and he just stands there. He doesn't do anything. He just stands there and stares at people as shit's happening. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, there's some special people in the world. <laughs> yeah. So where I live in Durham in England, we actually have a man who looks in- like Super Mario. <laughs> and he actually has his own Facebook group and everything. Are you serious? I'm serious. Do you know what his He's name brilliant. is? I don't know what his name is, but How do you sp- rumor has it that he is actually a university professor. <laughs> How do you spell the name of your city? Durham, D-U-R-H-A-M? Yeah. Isn't it Geordie Shore? No, that's a different place. <laughs> I'll find this. I swear, I swear he used to have his own Facebook group. The guy in Durham who looks like Mario, that's what it's called. That's that's him. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> it's facebook.com slash the guy in Durham who looks like Mario. That's amazing. Here's the link for you. <laughs> Uh, like when I'm driving home from work, sometimes I'll just see him walk by, and he just brightens up my day because he just looks—he just looks so insane. It's like his latest post is, "Why did ten people like this last night? What is this tomfoolery?" He's like, "I missed the 69th like." Somebody, I think, if you look through the photos, somebody actually got a photo with him where he's wearing a Super Mario shirt. <laughs> That's amazing. This oh, guy is man. ridiculously stupid. <laughs> See, if you looked at him, you wouldn't believe that hair and mustache were real. I'm going to like his page right now. <laughs> oh, man. Shall I see if I can get him on the podcast? Please. If you could get this guy on the podcast for our 50th episode. <laughs> Special. Oh, my God. And that was from 2013, his last post. This guy needs a resurgence. <laughs> We could... He's still alive. I've seen him. <laughs> Durham can't be a big city if you just see this guy everywhere. I do. <laughs> There's a guy who shuffles around in like a, a long trench coat as well who wears medals on his coat. He's quite interesting. That's funny. And a Russian hat. I don't see... It's very strange. I don't see any pictures of... No, oh, I think it's a different page. Well, you... At least we're so- slightly talking about games now. <laughs> you need to. You Mario. absolutely need to to work on getting this guy in the, on the show. Oh, Eric, I couldn't. I'd just laugh for the entire thing. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if he come on. He went, "It's a me, guy in Durham looks like Mario." <laughs> Wahoo! <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, work on it, Dan. <laughs> come on, take one for the team here. Like, how would you even broach that conversation? Like, hey, we uh, do a video game podcast, and I'm pretty sure you know that you look like Mario, but we need a really special guest. I really want to get, like, um, we could do a live video stream, and I could get him in the outfit and everything. It would be brilliant. That would be amazing. You, Dan, you could be the guy in Durham who looks like Luigi. Mm-hmm. You got that that goofy, gangly look to you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> but Luigi's a fucking tool. <laughs> You'd be perfect for the port. All right. I don't have to put up with this abuse. <laughs> Bye, Dan. <laughs> Bye. So, we, Dan and I actually have started, well, not started, we have restarted doing videos again. Mm. So people who've been following us for quite a long time know that Dan and I used to be quite... Um, frequent in our video recording and uh we've decided to to kick that up again but we're going to be doing retro stuff so to segue into our game of the week yesterday dan and i spent a good long while playing streets of rage we have to go back to this eddie starv stavros how did you find that out (laughs) because i'm a creepy person (laughs) hold on so did you find his real page 
Uh, no, I just searched him and there, like I just typed it into Google and there's not a huge amount of information oh. about him. Well, anyway, apparently the guy in Durham, his name is Eddie Stavros. Isn't, there's like a Durham general chat about him as well. Isn't there yes. a, isn't there an enemy in Zelda called the Stavros? Yeah. The bu- we actually have in England, we had a group who won um, Britain, or they didn't win Britain's Got Talent. They were called Stavros Flatley, and it's basically two fat dudes dancing to Greek music. <laughs> That's amazing. That's awesome. And uh, even about seven years later, they're still quite famous. That's funny. That would be interesting. With, like, the... What is it? Whatever has got talent? England's got talent? Britain. This, I, I found this chat room that you're talking about, Jess, and there are people like, where can I find him? <laughs> like, you make him sound like a Pokemon. Eddie Starvos <laughs> is super rare. <laughs> <laughs> He's not asking him all the time. He can normally be seen around Church Street, Elvet Bridge, but is often out and about in town. These people, Maybe that means I'm so an excellent funny. Pokemon trainer because I see him all the time. Dan, you have to get this guy on the show. <laughs> can you throw a Pokeball at him, too? I did. It actually just bounced off his head because he, he's Mario. He's not a Pokemon. Jeez. All right. Back to Streets of Rage. Um, yes. Dan and I decided to play through Streets of Rage. And in the process, we have discovered who between the two of us is the better Streets of Rage 2 player. And I'll give you one guess as to who it is. Um, it's ah, not, it's not him. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I can pull up the video where it has all of the names that we put in and, and who's at the top. All you did was steal my kills. <laughs> no, that's L- like Literally, fair. Jess, it was me beating the shit out of these guys and he would come from nowhere and steal the last punch and get the points. And I was yep. like, what's going on? <laughs> that sounds like him. So for those of you who don't know, Streets of Rage is a... Well, Dan, you know Streets of Rage better. You You give the little synopsis. Wow. Streets of Rage 2 is a classic side-scrolling brawler game for the Sega Genesis forward slash Mega Drive. How was that? That's it? Pretty lame. That's pr- pretty- it's pretty easy to describe <laughs> retro games. Yeah, that, that's basically it. You, you pick from four characters, you go from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. But, but in <laughs> and a, you beat the shit out of people on the way. But in an epic 16-bit twist, you can also go up and down on the screen. Oh. Mm. Yeah. But you cannot yes. go back to the left. Once you go no, right, you oh, okay. that's it. So who? what are the names of the characters? You have Max. Axel. Axel, Blaze, Skate. and Skate. Not skates. Yes. Skate. Singular. Skate. One S. No. Yes, one S. Yes, one That's S. Right. No, it's actually two. It's it's skates, but it's pronounced skate. It's a silent S. Okay. <laughs> so does that mean he's actually called Kate? Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I want to be Kate. Dan's just mad because I was so much better at it than he was. I don't play <laughs> brawler games at all. I actually kind of despise them with the exception of uh, the Turtles game and kind of the Simpsons game. But other than that, like the Double Dragon style games, not my, my cup of tea. But I told Dan, you you have an hour to sell me on this. Unfortunately, the game took less than an hour for us to not beat. And... <laughs> <laughs> I actually enjoyed it because I was so much better at it than he was. I mean, somehow oh, I had more lives, and I constantly had two, if not three times more points than he did. And You had... No, 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 no. Uh-huh. You had more lives because you'd actually died and used a continue. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I'm going to call you out on that because about ten minutes into it, you're like, how did you get another life? And I had four, and you had three, and I had yet to die yet. And yet you still... Died before me. Yeah, the end. quite. <laughs> but I do believe that is because of the amount of apples and turkeys and gold bars that I ingested through my crotch. Yes, you did steal them all. I'm sorry, what? So when you beat up a trash can or break down a road barricade, 
either an apple or a turkey or some coins or some gold bars, if you're lucky, will fall onto the ground. How did they get a turkey inside a road barricade? Uh, and the only it's way to pick it up though. is to sit on it. <laughs> so I was naturally playing as Blaze, the only female character, first, and you sit on it. And we went into this long philosophical discussion about where does it go? And there's only one. Sh- there's, there's, yeah, there's only one option. Nature's hiding place. Yeah. Now it makes more sense. I mean, that's how all people consume apples, right? Yeah. It just got a little weird when we started playing as Axel and Max. It's like, where are they putting these? Up their uh, imagine people just wandering around squ- squatting over apples. <laughs> <laughs> It did take me a solid five minutes to to realize that my basic attack, which is the A button, which is the one that you naturally want to hit, expends health. So halfway through, I'm like, I'm kicking some serious butt here, but why am I almost dead? And Dan's like, don't hit your A A attack. Yeah, that was pretty stupid, wasn't it? (laughs) But yeah, because... Did you know Mm -mm. that people would use um, alcohol-soaked tampons to get themselves drunk? Kids were doing that. This is is going downhill quickly. What the hell is this? What's this got to do with anything? (laughs) Absorbing the apple. It's a direct route. (laughs) Semi-permeable membrane. (laughs) Makes sense. Are you... These people were ahead of their time. <laughs> hey, Jess. Eric, where did you find her? Je- <laughs> Jess? Jesus Christ. Yes. Are you speaking from experience? No. Oh, okay. I suppose it does make sense, though, because certain medications given through suppository are far more effective. Oh, apparently it's false on snoops. So in Canada, women stick tampons up their flutes to get pissed. Isn't a flute an instrument? It is, but it can also be a female lady garden. <laughs> God. Well, this went downhill quickly. <laughs> oh, God. What other fun little things do you call it? Um, I don't even... We have so, so many uh, derogatory terms. Oh, this is a good terms. one. A growler. A growler. I don't think I... <laughs> did you, have you ever seen the movie Teeth? Low flaps? Yes. Dan, have you ever seen the movie Teeth? I haven't, but I, I know what it is. You do or don't? I do. Okay, good. Then we will not go into it. Google the movie Teeth if you would like to watch an awesome movie. Oh, don't. It's amazing. We used to sit in college N- and just... NSFW. Come up with ridiculous names for lady parts. <laughs> Like the meat wallet, the hatchet wound, um, the, I've v- heard that. the vertical smile. <laughs> so we'll stop there. Oh, uh, God, this is getting terrible. Let's go back to Streets of Rage. Or yeah. at least try. Yes. Um, I, so what other objects can you ingest through your vagina on Streets of Rage, Joe? <laughs> I think we came up with like Turkeys, apparently. full bags of coins fit just nicely. Um uh, gold bars. Gold bars. Uh, Knives. You can't you can't ingest weapons through your vagina, unfortunately. No. You actually pick them up. What about Which the seems turkey? Like a shame. That makes me a little a little terrified. Because the turkey's so impressive to get up your vagina, it actually gives you full health as well. It does. So, and it is a fully but, cooked, plated and garnished turkey. Which comes from inside a roadblock. Or a garbage can. So that means in the world of Streets of Rage, there exists a job within the city where you do nothing but cook turkeys and plant them in garbage cans and roadblocks and oil drums. And then every time somebody comes along and breaks them, you have to come back and replace the old garbage can, cook a new turkey and put it in in (laughs) case they come back? Yes. So it's just inconvenient. It sounds like a terrible job. I mean, but 
I got to give props to him because it's kind of like Obamacare, where they're just making sure that everybody has access to free health. All you have to do is break mm-hmm. something. And by breaking something, you therefore create more jobs. So on Streets of Rage, basically, you can get kicked in the face, punched loads, um, thrown around, and then just eat a turkey from a bin, and then you're fine. Yeah. So that, that makes sense. Dirty turkeys are yeah. great. The Japanese actually have a thing for turkeys being healing in games, don't they? I think so. I think um, yeah. Tekken, Tekken had them as well. Yep. On Tekken, Tekken Force. Hmm. I remember that. Yeah. So, Dan, what sets this brawler apart from other brawlers? And I know you and I talked about this kind of at the end, because at the end when we were done, I'm like, yeah, I, I actually enjoyed that, because I think there's a lot of stuff that's different about it. I think it's because it's it has a lot of co-op uh, playable value. If um, like uh, we had an absolute blast playing through the the co-op, I mean even now it still holds up and is really good. So I think it's that, and you have a lot of different moves. Yeah, like, uh, special moves which take off your health and you don't realize. <laughs> and uh, the levels are quite varied. Uh, the enemies, just... not so much, because normal enemies will become a boss, and then that boss later will become a normal enemy again. So they do just kind of rinse and repeat. Oh, yeah, kind of. But um, if you play Streets of Rage 3, which is um, quite underrated, actually. Uh, is that for the Genesis like... Master System as well? Or Mega Drive? It is, yes. It is, yeah. And uh, that one's um, it kind of builds on the second one a bit. Oh, boy, because there's such a deep storyline. <laughs> Well, the third one does have a storyline. What is it? Wow. Uh, a, a guy who's really a robot wants to take over the city. And uh, he wants to sack all the people who put turkeys in bins. Okay. Because then advent- then adventurers can keep getting health and come stop him. Oh, I see. So Now that's that I think line. about it, there was actually a little bit of a storyline when you start the game up, but I skipped it. Oh, yeah. It was like some disembodied head and hands over a city. So let's go Bloodborne Dark Souls style here and just like you make your own lore. So that's the story for Streets of Rage. It's go from left to right, punch people, eat turkeys, and beat the game. What are the differences between it and the first one? Because I remember playing the first one. Oh, pre- it's pretty drastic, actually. It kind of It's the same concept, but like the animations are a lot better. Did they have a lot, a- of the, like a, a lot of different moves as well? Because... Compared yeah, to, because yeah. you and I started playing the Turtles in Time afterwards, and like this is really kind of basic because they had jump, kick, and attack, and that was it. There was no combination yeah. of anything in between. Whereas this actually felt more like a cross between a one on one fighting game mixed with a brawler. You had different move sets that you could do, um, like throws and grapples and jump on people, and you know, pressing different combinations of buttons would do different attacks. And I think well on street on Streets of Rage one you actually had um it was your special attack you had to actually pick up icons like little police cars uh-huh. and then it would summon a police car which would come from the left and it would shoot like a missile which would like knock out all the enemies over on screen and cause massive damage hmm. so that was the special move in the first one but they took that out for the second hmm. and then if you get to um Streets of Rage three you actually have a meter which fills up over time. That, then you can do your special moves without it hurting you. Oh. So they're kind of all very different in a way. Which is but good. all very good. So there, there is progress from one to three. I didn't... It's not just the same old shit over and over again. I didn't care too much for the special attack because once you start it, you cannot stop it. And trying to line it up with an enemy or a boss is very, very difficult. So half the time I'd just be swinging away at absolutely nothing. Like, well, this is going to hurt for no reason. Yeah. But then um, when it would land, I would save Dan from certain peril. <laughs> and come in and swoop in and steal the kill. Yeah. So Jess, did you not play it? The second one, no. Oh. It's good. I mean, I would honestly... Dan, if you and I ever pissing about one night, I'd be like, yeah, let's play some Streets of Rage again. It was fun. It was actually a pretty good time. Yeah, we should try the third one. And then we decided to do a duel afterwards. And oh, do you want to guess who won that one, Jess? 
I'm going to go with Eric yeah. just because it's a recurring theme. Yeah, my computer lagged at that point. So you got lucky. B S. <laughs> so, well, I'll go and eat some herbs. I will. Um. Oh, we went back to another Genesis classic as well, and I actually just uploaded the video of that to my YouTube channel, The Real Honest Pizza. Shameless plug. Well, if people want to watch it. <laughs> oh, wait, no, I also set up a page on the website that we're going to be putting them all on, too. Plus, they'll just show up on the homepage. Um, yeah, we're, we're hoping to get back into doing videos. It is So anybody who hilarious. liked them in the past, because our old ones are just something else. Oh, I went back really. and watched the Bunch of Dudes in a Jeep episode of Battlefield 3, and that never oh, gets God. old. I like the M Saints Row ones. Yes. Saints Row ones. Yeah. We should probably get Saints Row four for PS4 and play through that again. Mm. Mm. Um, the one, um, the one, the Saints Row one where you're in a jet, and I'm in a jet, and I fall from my jet onto your jet, <laughs> and it's perfectly timed with the William Tell overture. <laughs> it's just, I just, I don't know even know how we did that. It's just the music. I didn't even know the music was on, and it's just so perfectly timed. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, half the stuff that we did was perfectly timed too. I mean, we made a music video as an outro, and we just were—I just pulled a section of a of a uh, video that we made and made a beat to it, and it just all happened to line up. And it's just one of the funniest things. Yeah, Saints Row the Third sexy dance video. I remember it well. <laughs> it's, it's. I'm gonna find it's it. It's like 20 seconds of pure comedy gold. Um. <laughs> We played Road Rash 2. Jess, did you ever play any of the old Road Rash games? No, but do you know what is hilarious that you guys were playing it? What? Andrew got a motorcycle. Did he get some chains with it? Does he Does he go around whipping people with a chain while he's on it? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe we could make that happen. I just got rid of my motorcycle not too long ago, which is the... Really? Oh, yeah, well... It needed to be gotten rid of. Uh, riding motorcycles in Phoenix is not safe. Really? Yeah. It's just a really busy city. So when we move back to Wisconsin, I'll get another one. Very cool. Yeah. And then I'll so ride thought... it out to see you guys. I yeah. found the video. Oh, geez. <laughs> Jess, have you seen this video? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, it's a classic forgot where i was going with what we were talking about road rash uh, motorcycles yes. road, road rash, rash. Yes. um for those of you unfamiliar with the concept of road rash it is a game where you ride motorcycles and punch and kick people uh it took dan and i a very long time to figure that out on road rash 2 we knew the concept but actually executing the concept was very difficult because the old Genesis did not handle those uh, racing style games very well. It was very, very, very difficult to control. And I think for the, oh, first, God. the first race, Dan had no idea how to even go forward. <laughs> and then halfway through... Because when, when you press accelerate, it looks like they just do a wheelie. And then I wasn't sure if he was actually moving forward. Well, halfway it. through the race, we're both off of our motorcycles and just running. <laughs> and then we got uh, we got arrested. <laughs> Because we were running for something, we were trying to meet up in the middle, and then we got arrested. Well, then we looked at the odometer and realized that Dan is like a mile and a half behind me, and you actually run at your normal speed, so... But then we also discovered that there's a pointless thing where if you press a button, the character does a stupid pose <laughs> hey. where they just look really homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> they stop and do their selfie pose. It was just so stupid. <sighs> that is amazing. It's a good time. It's so I don't know if there's play. a whole lot to say about Road Rash 2, but Road Rash 3D for the PlayStation 1 is a fantastic iteration of that game, and I'm kind of sad that that <laughs> series died off because that game had it all. You Absolutely every type of weapon. You could upgrade your motorcycle, tons of different types of tracks. This one, it felt think... very difficult to try to hit people off the cycle. Yeah, well, it didn't help that you could barely see them. Yeah. So... They're talking on the split screen as well. The characters are tiny. Oh, so it's like, God. 
Yeah. It was true. Imagine what it would be like in like modern times, those road rush. You could probably jump from your bike onto someone else's bike, stab them in the neck, then jump back <laughs> onto your bike. It would be sweet. <laughs> and then if you could do the, the multiplayer co-op where one person sits on the back with the weapons and the other person's driving. Yeah. There was a there was a there was a PSP game kind of like that. It was a cop style game. Was it called Rush Road? Uh no. It was not. Um, it's, I want to say like out, Outland, PSP. I don't know. I don't. Oh, it is THQ. So that makes sense that you would be able to like jump off of your motorcycle. Why would that make haven't sense? T- haven't THQ went with Saints Row? Road, like mm. I feel like it's very like mm-hmm. that type of THQ did get uh, liquidated. Did they? Yeah, THQ's yeah, no they longer. Did, they're gone. That was a huge story not too long ago. Polygon did a really cool write up about like the whole concept or the whole process and why it happened and Oh. It's gonna bother me that I That sounds familiar. I can't remember the name of this PSP game. I'm not gonna go through forty pages of crappy PSP games to try to find it. <laughs> um Dan, you said yeah, you had a Road Rush too, it's up. You said you had a special retro game that you played for this week. Oh god. So bad. So um, I have a box of ancient games under my bed, mm-hmm. which are like PS1 classics and some not so PS1 classics. And I was looking through it and I was like, what's the most obscure one that I've never really finished? And it's uh, Casper, the Friendly Ghost oh, for PlayStation 1. See, oh my God, I freaking love that movie so bad. I've heard a lot of mixed <laughs> things about that. Some people are like, hey, I love it. Oh, hold on, hold on. Pursuit Force is what that was called for PSP. All right. Yeah, you can jump from your motorcycle to other people's. Anyway, back to Casper. Mm, interesting. Oh, God, the game is the hardest game in the world. It's it's not like you'd expect. It's a puzzle game. What? Where um, you're basically in Casper's house. You can go into loads of different rooms, and you have to find keys and open chests and do puzzles and... So uh, fight as uh, fight ghosts as enemies and stuff like that. But then you just you spend literally you'll find a, something in one room which is at the other end of the house. And you'll have to go through about fifteen different rooms trying to memorize the layout to get to the other place. If I'm sorry, so, I'm going to ask the important question. I think you're going to ask the same thing. I'm going to. Is Devon well, Sawa in oh, the movie? Okay, not even game. close. Is it? Ew. Devon Sawa. Ew. Shut your mouth. He was Who? Casper. Yeah. Oh Who my the God. hell are you talking about? Devin Sawa. Casper was a ghost. Yeah, but he <laughs> played him in the movie. His Why voice do you know this? Into him because he was like the most attractive person in the entire world when I was Wasn't like Wasn't he 14. like a little pasty white ginger kid? No, he was blonde How do you spell and his tall name? Devin. S-A-W-A. But D-O-V-O-N. Oh, Devon. Devon Sauer. Wow, he hasn't aged well. <laughs> Thanks for saying it, because I was thinking it. He kind of looks like Jeremy <laughs> Reiner. He looks oh, a little like, haggard. He looks like a tool in that film. Yeah, he does sweet, no. sweet bowl haircut put right down the middle. He's got curtains in his hair. <laughs> My friends and I used to like pause the movie when he turned it. <laughs> You guys would pause the movie? Then did, then did they, then did they yeah. insert things in them? Yes. No. <laughs> My God. Are you sure? He looks like a Backstreet Boy. That was well, very in back then. Eric. that was the rage. And he was in Final Destination. Oh, he was he the main guy? Yeah. Oh, I liked him in Final Destination. I'll give him that. That's right. So Dan, the Eric loves the too. important question that I thought Jess was going to ask, <laughs> game being game related, was since Casper is a ghost, are you bound by the physical realm, or can you just willy nilly go through the walls? You can't actually go over the walls or through the walls, which is a missed opportunity. But you can fly upwards and downwards. Ooh, fancy! Which is, and you also get different powers where you can turn into a, bo- a ball and you can bounce through little holes. And you can also turn into a buzzsaw and go through boards. Hmm. So, Did they explain uh, why you couldn't go through the walls? No, actually. Huh. But, there uh, was a game that just came out on PS4 and PS3 called Murdered uh, Soul Suspect that was kind of along the same concept where you were a ghost and 
That was ages ago. Well, it was okay, whatever. But anyway, um, th- I like I kind of like how they dealt with it. The whole concept of not being able to go through the walls was the um, curses that people put on their house to prevent ghosts from entering. So there was actually like a a piece of the game that is a reason rather than like, you just can't. Yeah. But I suppose they lacked that foresight. Well, that was convenient. Yeah. You just can't do it. Trust me. It's not worth it. Hmm. My other question to you is why the hell do you have Casper on the PlayStation one? Cause I was a child <laughs> and I wanted it and it was, so, so difficult. I was thinking about this the other day. I was looking through all of my old PlayStation 1 and Super Nintendo and Genesis games and stuff like that. And everybody's always talking about, like, oh, this is the rarest game that I have. But rare doesn't always mean unknown. Good. And oh. I kind of was... I wanted to pose a question to our listeners about um, what is the most obscure game you have? Not necessarily rare, but just obscure as in... Who the hell, what the hell game is this? I've never heard of this before because I have one that. That's what we should do for the 50th play the most obscure games in the world. That would be fun. So let's compile a list of the most obscure games. Send us your emails or drop them on Facebook. But back to mine, I was flipping through my old PS1 games and I would say of the hundred or so that I have, like 70% of them are RPGs. And there was a phase where I would go through just buy games, just. Like, I've never heard of this before. What is it? And then come to find out it's a pretty common game. But I have yet to find anybody else that's heard of this game, and it's called Cartia, The Word of Fate. Nope. Never heard of that. It's a tactics-based RPG, kind of like Final Fantasy Tactics. Phenomenal game. It it actually plays a lot more like Ogre Battle, but I guess you're comparing apples and apples there. But... I would say that's got to be my most obscure game because I have yet to come across anybody else who's even heard of that game, much less played it. Huh. What is the most obscure game that you have, Dan? Um, I have a few RPGs for the Xbox 360, which weren't that popular. Like? Um, Enchanted Arms. I loved that game. Yeah, it was good. Yes, that had such a unique battle system where wasn't that where you had the line in the middle and then you could move up to that line but not necessarily across it and i really can't remember you know what i don't think i actually still have it oh. so i do remember uh, that game and then i had out. it was it was long too oh yeah it was a really it was quite a good rpg um the second one, i really liked lost odyssey as well i need to go for, through um, and play ex- that yeah that's really good uh, i have a weird story about lost odyssey Okay. If anybody's interested, it's um, one of the only Xbox 360 games that comes with four discs. But uh, in England, I don't know why, in the box, they couldn't fit all four discs on the um, little stalk in the box. Mm-hmm. So one of the discs comes in a little plastic wallet. Uh. And uh, this is quite a common problem with the discs. Disc four wouldn't work because it was in this plastic wallet and it got some kind of sticky residue on it. <laughs> so you would you would sort of try to play it and then it would um it would basically crash and just like stop after about two minutes. And it's uh I looked it up online and then somebody was saying literally put your disc in a, a like bowl of boiling water. And I was like, I remember I'm not you doing telling that. me about that. Yeah, and uh I was like, that's n- never gonna work. And then I just got the game, so I was like, I'm not gonna do that, and then I just left it and never finished it. Then I come back to it later, and I was, um, I was like, "All right, I, I haven't played this forever now. I really don't care." So I put it in some boiling water, and uh, left it for a while. Got it out, cleaned it, put it in my PlayStation. Works flawlessly. I could have. That's so abs- weird. I could imagine. It's it's so strange, but like you would never expect that to work ever, and it it did. And I, I finished it. I completely finished Lost Odyssey, and I was like. What the hell's going on? It makes sense because if it's just a sticky residue, and just boil it off, and then the water it yeah, kind of dilutes would, itself you in the water. You would never boil the disc, though, would well, you? It's not, not going to deform it. I mean, boiling water is not going to get that hot that it melts the disc. If they told you to put it in the microwave, I'd say that's probably a bad idea. Yeah, but it's just uh, hilarious that it's like a a known thing. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's like and, it's um, the new blowing on the cartridge. It's boiling it's, so, it's so strange. And um oh uh, for Xbox three sixty I also had uh, The Last Remnant. Okay. Everybody, everybody ever played that? I did not play it, but I, I I'm aware of it. It was basically it was um I think it was Square or Enix, you know. Uh-huh. And they built it on the Unreal Engine. And uh, clearly the developers had never used the Unreal Engine before because that game's got some quirks. <laughs> huh. So uh, Jack G 157 in the chat just mentioned his obscure PS1 game, Overboard. I remember this. Overboard. It's a pirate game. It's a pirate game where you have to uh, sink ships and shit. I, I'm sure it is. I used to have a demo. Huh. He just put a link to a Wikipedia page that describes the term overboard. Yes, this this is it. Oh, here we go. It's by Psygnosis. Okay. I have seen this game before, yes. Me too. I used to have it on a demo. I know I did. Here is the Cartilla game. I'm going to put a link in the chat. I don't can't hear the word of fit. Yeah, somebody brought it in to... I was working at GameStop at the time, and somebody brought it in, and we had just stopped accepting trades on PlayStation games. I'm like, I really don't want this. I'm like, I'll give you five bucks for it. Come to find out it's pretty rare. I mean, I don't, I don't know how rare or what it's necessarily worth, but... I have yet to. You know, the art design, the art designer was from Final Fantasy. I mainly bought it because it was, yeah, it was um, Yoshitaka Amano, and then it was done by Atlas. I'm like my favorite character designer, along with one of my favorite developers. Yeah, this is going to be good, and it is good. But if you've ever played a tactics based RPG, they take ages to play. Yeah, the last, the last remnant was quite tactical based. Have you you've played uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, right? No. It's one of those games that it's fantastic. It's really hard to go back to, especially if you don't have a lot of free time, because some of those battles can take upwards of 45 minutes to an hour for one battle. And they're mm. just basic non-boss battles. <laughs> i tell you my final obscure RPG I used to have for um, Xbox 360. Infinite Undiscovery. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> we used to Which, sit and make fun of that. Like the, ti- the title makes no sense. It has nothing to do with the game. The concept of infinite undiscovery is the moon is in chains. And you, for some reason, have to break these chains. Okay. And I can't remember why, but it has nothing to do with infinite undiscovery. Just making up words. It's like uh, Metal Gear Rise and Revengeance all over oh, again. Oh, God. But I could give a pass to Kojima on that because he's such a goofy guy. Yeah. I wonder what's going on with him. I don't know. They canceled the new Silent Hills game, which I'm pretty upset about. Yeah. That was supposed to be done with Kojima and Del Toro. But they've finally come out. And it was supposed to have the Daryl from Walking Dead kind of as the main character. Oh, my dear God. Yeah. Are you a Daryl fan? Oh, my God. I so am. Uh, Jess, what is your most obscure game? You don't really have a lot of games, though, do you? No, I was trying to remember. There's this one game, and I can't remember it. And I'm going to try to figure it out. But there, it was a monster game for PC. And there was, like, this torture chamber that you could go in. And then I'm pretty sure two of the monsters went into the torture chamber together. And I was very concerned about that when I was a child. But... I also really loved, I don't know if you guys ever played this, and it was so lame, but I loved it, Escape from Horrorland. It was a Goosebumps game. (laughs) Oh my god. I used to love them books Um, so much. Yeah, so it was like this really weird game, and it was kind of like a point-and-click-esque game. Was this for PC? Yeah. Um, It doesn't even have like its own wikipedia page it's tacked oh. under goosebumps video game series um but it was fun like you went around the theme park and you if you read the book the one day at Horrorland, it was a haunted haunted theme park and uh you had to go around and like kind of puzzle-esque elements to it because you had to do certain things at a certain time to like release valves and try to blow up the game and there are monsters in it 
and it was um, all. I'm pretty sure it was like live action in a sense that the entire game was filmed huh. and then oh. it was just kind of cut scene esque. I'd love the Horrorland stories. I even, I, I'm sure I used to have a um, goosebumps, like, you know, the adventure books where you ch- turn to a certain page based on what you chose at the yeah. end. Yeah. I'm sure I used to have one that was Horrorland. Hmm. And it was they would make me so stressed, though, that I made the wrong choice. Well, that's why you could just yeah. go back. It's true. I suppose like the well, Walking Dead and what page you're on. The Walking Dead and Wolf Among Us are just modern versions of choose your own adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, another rare game or unknown game that I have, I guess a lot of people don't necessarily know that it exists, is um, back on the GameCube when The Wind Waker came out. If you pre-ordered it. You ha- you got a special two game bonus disc that had the Ocarina of Time along with the Ocarina of Time Master Quest, which was only available in this bundle, and it was an extra dungeon for Ocarina of Time. And it's, no, that's not that, that's not that obscure. Have you heard of it? Master yeah. Quest. Yeah. Yeah. Have you played it? It's on the three DS version. Is it? Yeah. Oh, son of a bitch, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but the GameCube card, I mean, I have, I still have that when I pre-ordered it. Like, I don't need to play Ocarina of Time again, so I just kept it, and it's still sealed. So. Mm, interesting. interesting. Um, uh, I've got, uh, well, so I've got uh, the PS1 games. I've got all the old Tomb Raiders. Yeah. Uh, all the old Final Fantasies. Um... I used to have Pandemonium. That was strange. Anybody ever play a Pandemonium? No. It's like a side-scrolling game and it had to do with magic and stuff. It was weird. Huh. I used to have loads of demo discs. Those demo discs were great. I was just talking about uh, this with my sister's fiancé the other day about playing through the Final Fantasy VIII demo disc just multiple times over in preparation. I don't think I had that. I don't think I had that. I had... Uh, I had a Hercules demo disc. The Hercules game for PS1 was amazing. I want to so what good. game did that come with? The Final Fantasy VIII demo. I think it came with Brave Fencer Cra- Musashi? I think it's um, Crash Bandicoot, you know. What did it come with? I think it was Crash Bandicoot. I'm sure I've still got it. It may have been. They Those demo discs were great. They used to come out in... So many different instances. Oh, yeah. I used to get them from a games magazine every so often. It would be annoying because they wouldn't necessarily tell you if it was just a video or if it was an actual playable game. So you're like, yeah, it's a demo for Brave Fencer Musashi. Oh, it's a video. I used to actually have like a VHS where it was um, it was just cheats for the Mega Drive and I just used to sit and watch it because like, I couldn't... But- obviously buy games myself then because I was a child. <laughs> so it's just like I used to sit and watch it and go, that looks really good. That's funny. I'd love to have that game. Just ask Eric's grandma. Yep. Oh, the Square Enix used to release the collector's CDs. That's what they were, and it came on that. Mm-hmm. So it was on volume two. I swear I... it came with Crash Bandicoot. It may have. I don't know. Like is the Google demo search? any different? Yeah, the demo is a little different, um, just in terms of... Oh, yeah, Ryan Noah, Ryan Noah's in the game at the start. Yeah. And then the, the graphical mm. difference is a little... They wear different claws. Yeah. They have different people in different parts of the cutscenes. Like when... Facial structures are slightly different. Dialogue is completely different. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> mm. So yeah, send us uh, send us some emails with some of your most obscure games. Not necessarily rare, hard to find, but obscure shit. Just things that you don't think people have ever heard of. And if we can, we will try to put that together for our 50th show. Um, I discovered the monster one. It's called The Ultimate Haunted House. The Ultimate Haunted House? Yep. Hmm. Um, did you guys play anything else? Oh, wow, that that looks awesome. 
Uh, I tried Dishonored again. That game didn't hold up very well. It did not age well. It looks re- it looks really old. It it looked old when it came out. Oh, I'll tell you what really annoys me about it. The stupid animations I've got for the characters. Yeah. Where they've, they've clearly tried to put in cool animations, but they've just overdone it. And it just looks weird. Yeah. Like, there's one where the characters, I've seen at least two different characters do it. They kind of rub down the face and then rub across the cheek. Yeah. And then there's another one where this guy takes out a bottle from his jacket and then starts True. having a swig of alcohol and then puts his bottle away and back in his jacket. And he does about three times in the same conversation. I'm just like, you, this is just unnecessary. <laughs> why don't you just keep it out? <laughs> and I'm just like, it's, it's, just, like in the, it's just annoying. It's like in the old PlayStation games when you're talking to somebody and they're they're doing an animation and if you just let that text sit there they'll just sit there to continue and wave their hand or like bounce around and do their little dance yeah this uh, all the old final fantasies have yeah. them where like squall will fold his arms and look off to the side or put his head in his hands oh i know what i wanted mm-hmm. to talk about with you dan what the end of bloodborne because you finally finished it oh yeah so if you if you don't want to have <laughs> if you don't want to have one of the endings of Bloodborne spoiled for you, skip ahead a couple minutes. Um, Dan, you yeah. you got the it's I technically would consider it to be the secret ending of the Moon Presence, correct? Well, I think you'd never know about that unless you looked it up. Exactly. Um, in order to so. get that, you have to throughout the course of the game you come across these umbilical cords, and it says it's a consumable item. Doesn't necessarily do anything. But if you consume all three of the umbilical cords within the game before the final boss, once you beat the final boss, if you choose to fight him, which is kind of weird too, you can say, nah, I don't want to fight you, and then he kills you and it's game over. But if you choose to fight him and then beat him, the moon presence comes down and you have to fight her. Well, she tries to kill you and turn you into, or just tries to flat out kill you, but if you've uh, eaten the umbilical cords, you can fight her. Yeah. And then if you beat her... But do you want me to spoil... Do you know what happens on the other end? Then? I've read about them, yeah. Yeah, on the second end, apparently, the moon presence embraces you. Yeah. And uh, just takes you away or something, I think. Yeah. But um, but on, on this one, I think it's because you've consumed the umbilical cords. You were saying, Eric, apparently you've become what's known as a great yep. one, which is like a, a, a beast, like one of the mythical beasts or something. And then because you, that's happened to you, she doesn't want you anymore, so she, like, rejects you. And that's why she attacks you because it's it's all to do with motherhood and things this, like you were saying before. This whole game and, uh, is about menstruation and abortion and motherhood. Yeah, it's got to be. But then at the after that, you see the living doll thing pick up like a weird worm thing, which it's a, I assume it looks like is a squid. you. I assume that's your character reborn as a, a the great one. Yeah, I, I think that's what it's all about. But it's it's just it's one of them games where you have to make it up yourself and maybe we're right maybe we're wrong who knows and i think that's why i like these games so much is because you can take as much as you want or leave as much as you want you're just like i'm just gonna they just drop you in and you just know go kill these things and that's it but there's this whole underlying lore that if you want to discover it you can but if not just go kill these things and get to the end of the game be done with it and start over yep so that's the end of bloodborne um so it was very strange, but uh, absolutely fantastic game. One of the best PS4 games that's come out so far. The, true, the first so, true AAA title, in my opinion, to live up to its hype. Yep. Yeah, it still definitely. had some shortcomings, but not nearly as broken. Now, would you say it's better than Dark Souls? Um, definitely better than Dark Souls 2. I think it's different than Dark Souls 1. I think this is more on par with Demon Souls in terms of difficulty mainly mm. because they took out the ability to block. It's more of an aggressive game. Yeah, I, I think uh, I like it. I think I, I like it better. I think it, if I went back and played Dark Souls now, it would seem very slow. Very, because it's all about blocking and tactics. Dodge, yeah. but um, uh, Both games are equally as good, I would say. Um, but um, I, I kind of hope they make another Bloodborne or something different again. Because it was pretty good. Yes. I'd be happy with the sequel. I would be. I'd, there'd definitely be one. Um, no, most likely. Did we guys, did we play anything else? 
No, I think that's it for this week. All right. Let's go to some emails. I wanted to play Toy Story Oh, no. 2. Toy Story 2. Us. Oh, what a game that was. Wow. I like the game. I played the Game Boy one, mm-hmm. not the N64 one. Dan, did you play the N64 one? I had it on PS1, I think. Oh, okay. I think, they were, I think they were the same. Yeah. It's like a three. It's like a three D platformer kind of game, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 I had that. I've been playing um, this week a lot of Oli Oli Two. Actually, that game is so good. It's so irritating, but it's so addictive. <laughs> yeah. I am. Um, I was up the other night until one o'clock in the morning playing on it because like I started about twelve and I was like, I'll play a couple of levels. Yeah. I'll do some challenges, and then before I knew it, it was one o'clock, and I'd been doing the same level for the whole hour. <laughs> And I was like, oh, no. I got to a point but, with right. it where I was like, you know what? I beat all the levels. I got most of the the challenges. And then it gets down to the pro levels at the like the second row. I'm like, I'm not even going to bother with this. Yeah, I've started doing the pro levels. And my God, they are I difficult. can't even get close. There's another difficulty after that as well. No, thanks. It, it was addicting uh, for a very short period of time. And then it's like, and I'm done with this. Yeah, I, I'm determined to beat it. Oh, <laughs> I've done quite a few of the challenges on the pro mode now. Yeah. But you're talking, um, some of them you have to get about 3 million points oh, man. on a single run. And I'm just like, oh no. How oh, is that even possible? And then I looked, at, I looked at the challenges on the last level. You have to do, you have to do eight revert manuals mm-hmm. and eight grind switches in, on a really difficult level. Jeez. So I was just like, that's impossible. <laughs> but I might try to plug away at it a bit more. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, let's go to some emails. If you want to send us an email, factorysealed at manatank.com. And you should send us yeah. emails because we, we like We need emails. more. Uh, they're starting to trickle in occasionally here, but we need more emails. Um, questions, suggestions, thoughts. Um, my Some of my favorite emails are just how people discovered us. It's just like the the dude in Alaska who was an apple picker or something. He's like, I was just out in the field one day and just saw your logo. I'm like, I'm gonna start listening to you. Stuff like that. Fair Stuff enough. like that to me is cool. <laughs> does he does he ingest them through his <sighs> vagina? If you're listening, <laughs> please tell us your preferred method of ingesting apples. Jay Jorgensen writes in, Dear Factory Seal Crew, argue about which console is the best ever. My argument goes to Super Nintendo. Greatest gaming console ever. Awesome library that includes Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, and Super Mario World. Also, that controller was sexier than any other. Best console ever. I already know what I'm going to choose. Best console ever. You know what? Just because it was my first ever console, and I loved it, I'm going to go with the Mega Drive. Really? 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 Because wow. I love that thing. Oh, that's an interesting choice. And closely followed by the PlayStation Thank 1. Thank you. That's my choice for best console ever. Because that was just revolutionary at the time, and I had so many good games The for PlayStation it. 1 crushed the N64, in my opinion. I know that the N64 had a ton of really good games, but the PlayStation 1 absolutely revolutionized well, the Nintendo 64 is kind of like the Wii U again. The Wii U has loads of really good games, but nobody has yeah. one. Shut up. So, N64 was the best one. Is that what you're going with? Yeah. Oh, I, I did like the N64 a lot, but I didn't have one at the time, so I've experienced it later as an adult. So, But there is some really good games. Like I love um, Banjo-Tooie and Banjo-Kazooie and... Uh, What's what you may call it? Donkey Kong Country and Conker's Bad Fur Day and all them. I love them. They're such good games. Like that's the one that I go back to for a lot of things. And like um, Mario Kart, like replay that all the time. Golden Eye, like it's. I think a really social console, if that makes sense. Like Mario Party, Super Smash Brothers, like those yeah. are the games that I have the best memories of playing with other people. Um, so that's why I think it's the best one. It was so like yeah, I, I have my co-op memories are more from the Mega Drive, like playing Streets of Rage and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. 
like uh, when I was playing with Eric yesterday, it was just a blast because it reminded me of childhood. And I was just like, this is awesome. Here's here's an interesting statistic. I'm I'm just kind of loosely pulling these, but it kind of gives you an idea of um, obviously quantity doesn't equal quality, but the the North American release for N64 games topped out at just about 300. Whereas the PlayStation topped out at almost 1,300. 1,300 what? Oh, I thought you were talking about dollars or numbers. I was super confused. The N64 only released 300 games. Whereas the PlayStation released almost 1,300. So they released almost 1,000 more games. Um, But I think that goes back to the... Nintendo control that we've talked about before True. that the 300 games were quality games versus some of the shitty ones that you would find. True. For PlayStation but I could one. sit here probably for 10 minutes straight and just list fantastic PlayStation one games that spawned tons of franchises that are still going. Plus you have all those really obscure styles of games. I mean, well, for God's sakes, one of my favorite games ever was Alundra. And it's on the original PlayStation. It's a Zelda clone, but it's an incredible game. And you have this whole breadth and depth of RPG games and then platformer games. Um, the The sports games on PlayStation 1 were were far better than anything else. International track and field. Oh my god, I love that game. <laughs> it was but so I think, hard. Like, the most popular franchise would be Mario. I agree. Like ever. I agree. But I don't necessarily know if that makes the the N64 the best console. See, I, I, abs- I absolutely love Nintendo's first party games. I think they really push the ball out. They're very innovative and they're, yeah. they're really good at it. But like, the fact of the matter is the Wii U has been a massive flop. Yes. Oh, so yeah. The, unless they have something revolutionary with their next console, they're, they're gone and we'll be seeing Mario on something else. I think that... Because the only thing they changed was the controller. Like, that's really the only difference between the Wii and the Wii well, U. and they upped it to but no, uh, nobody HD knew, resolution. Nobody knew it was a new console, so... Well, and it's like the it's yeah. like the new 3DS. I mean, I have one of those too, but it's the, I can imagine in the retail world it's going to be massively confusing for the, the non-hardcore gamer that comes in and it's like, I need to buy this console and my my niece or my daughter or my nephew wants a ds so then they see the ds and then they see the new 3ds but they're technically the same with a little bit of difference and that's kind of the 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 gap that they took between the wii and the wii u they have this controller and a little bit better resolution but at the end of the day so there was a lot you could do with the yes Sorry, Joe. Sorry, Joe. Oh, I believe the Wii U is backwards Sorry. compatible with Wii games, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, it okay. is. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so you need to use. You need to have a Wii mode. Is it backwards compatible to the GameCube games? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Huh. But um, I don't have any anyway, so I haven't checked. Yeah. So um, I've d- I've played through Skyward Sword on my Wii U, so. Oh, okay. That works. Uh, but I think the the Wii U is a really it's a good concept, like. The whole the pad thing. It's um, zombie U. If you play that, that's really good with the pad. Yeah. Like because yeah. uh, um, you have uh, all your stuffs on your pad, so you have to look down at your pad to do change your weapons and shit like that. And uh, when you're looking away from the screen, a zombie can probably sneak up on you and scare the shit out of you. So yeah. <laughs> I actually felt the tension on that game, and that was really good. And but the pad just hasn't been realized. It hasn't been used for mo- many games, and it's just it's a waste of time, really. Hmm. Because it could be really cool. Like, oh it yeah, it's a it's a gim- it's a gimmick. Awesome. Really, it's just a gimmick. It's mainly just to have your map or your inventory. And I don't on think there, I would like that like... because it takes your attention away from the main screen. Mm. It can be distracting as well because sometimes it has the game on your pad while it's on the screen. Yeah. And it, like, if depending on how you're sitting, you can see both at the same time, and it's just like uh... this is irritating. But it is handy when some your like spouse is playing on is watching the telly or something. And you can play on. You can still play on yeah. your game on your pad, mm. which is pretty cool. But I don't know. It's just it's a shame, really, because it had a lot of potential. But I think Nintendo just needs to cut the losses and do something else, which apparently they are doing. I don't want them to ditch their so, handheld market because they've been the only people that really truly understand how the handheld market functions. I love my 3ds. I absolutely love that. Oh yeah, that's that's great. But um, I think apparently they are making a new console already. 
They need so, to cut with this gimmick crap. I mean, Sony realized, like, ooh, let's stop trying to push the 3D stuff. And um, both companies have kind of ditched the... The, the motion controls as well because it was a it was a fad within the industry the Wii captured it through and through and I think that was such a a phenomenon that the other companies like okay maybe this is where everybody wants to go so let's start dumping money into it but the, when that fad died Nintendo refused to accept that it was a passing fad but you know when VR comes out do you not think motion control is going to return I don't return? think VR is going to take off like everybody's expecting it to I think it will have a surge. It will, but I don't think it's then, going to be mainstay. Just, no, I, th- I think people I just like. I think, like, I think cool. people just like the sitting with the mm-hmm. TV, just play a game. I mean, you don't need all these gimmicks. They're fun for a while. Like, look at Guitar Hero. That's fun for a yep. while. But eventually, you get burnt out, and I, that's coming back this year now. And I don't know if that's going to work anymore. I think they're going to try to recapture some of that magic that used to exist. I don't mm. think you're ever going to see unless, the core. Unless it's a new generation, you're not going to... I don't think it's going to get to the level it ever I was. I don't think you're ever going to see the core yeah. mechanics of games change. It's going to be you with a controller interacting with a screen, whether it's a computer or a handheld or a TV with a console and a controller. I don't think you're ever really going to see that change too much. You'll see ebb and flow of, of different fads. But at the end of the day, people just, like you said, Dan, they just want to sit down and relax and play a game. That's deep, man. There's some really cool stuff. Like, um, I was at a conference this week, and um, one of the guys uh, who presented was doing, uh, he's in the game development program at my university, and he had a vest, like wearable, um, wearable tools, and he had a vest on that would actually shoot. It made you feel like you were shot by um, using air. Huh. Why am I Why would you want to get shot? Um, if you're playing like shooters and stuff. So when uh-huh. your character gets shot, there's like a pulse of air that hits your body not very hard, but it just kind of gives you that slight impact Pain to know simulators. where you got shot. Yeah, but it's cool because it lets uh, no you thanks. interact with the game on a higher level, which will increase the like amount that you can get into the game um imagine and think- feeling some of the attacks on bloodborne eric i would like <laughs> some sort of full body suit with a mask that would simulate me smashing through a windshield in grand theft auto well they have like fully wearable like suits and stuff that you can wear and i know there's tons of research going into so, those which is like so let's amazing. be honest jess gaming is already as it stands in its current form, one of the most expensive hobbies you can have. If you are an yep. avid, hardcore, regular, daily gamer who buys games as they come out, it is one of the most expensive. This stuff, VR suits and goggles and all this other crap, add to that expense. Do you really think that yeah, stuff's going to take off in the common core I field? Don't... I don't think it'll be home use stuff, but there's a lot of, um, um, like, I could see it being in an arcade type of environment mm-hmm. or, like, a reemergence of, like, virtual reality arcades and you go and you interact with the game. But um, there are a lot of practical applications in terms of, like, military use and training simulators yeah. and those types of things, which I can absolutely see those applications just pushing that. But... I also am still in love with Google Glass, and that's been killed. Thank so God. my, Is that not I don't really have anymore? the best tracker. No, well, they killed the program for personal use, but it still is doing. It's in business application development, but you can't purchase Google Glass for home yeah. use. Mm. So those who got oh, it, I know what I know what I want to talk. I know what I wanted to talk about. Sorry, oh. Eric. Uh, the u- have you guys heard about the ukulele thing? Yeah, you were telling me about this earlier. Yeah, the have what? you heard about this, Jess? Have you played Banjo Kazooie so. before? Yes. Uh, basically, a bunch of guys who used to work for Rare have gone and made their own company, and they're making a three D platform game called Ukulele, and it's basically it's kind of like Banjo. That's hilarious. But it's brand new, and they put a Kickstarter out for it. And uh, it's the fastest growing Kickstarter in, I think, history or something. It was it was oh, really? almost immediately funded. Yeah, wow. They, uh, 
at the time of this podcast being recorded, they've earned one million two hundred thirty-five thousand nine hundred eighty-nine pounds, and they only wanted two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for the game. And the and this launched on Thursday. How much time is left in the campaign? Forty-four oh days. God. Oh, that is a weird way of spelling ukulele. Yeah, because it's like banjo kazooie. It's yuka yeah. and lele. Definitely did not search that yeah. properly. So, yeah, Holy that that's crap. happening, and I think, and I think that means that people want to play a three D platformers yes. again. I there's a couple of series I'd like to see them bring back. I would really like to see them do a brand new Jack and Daxter game. Yes. Ja- God, Jack and yes. Dexter was so fantastic. I Ratchet and Clank survived, and Ratchet and Clank is fantastic. But let's continue some of these other great platforming games. Oh, Jack and Daxter three. That was such a good game. Two was a little goofy, but um Two was had really bad like traffic and yeah. shit, so that was annoying. But three was just super. Wasn't there a fourth Jack and Daxter game that was all racing? Yeah, it was for the PSP, I think. Yeah. And, uh, but the need to go back and do that. But I, th- I don't think Naughty Dog would do it because obviously they've well, moved the on to bigger things. Well, the one game, too, that I don't understand why Double Fine doesn't um, pursue is a, a Psychonauts 2. I'm sure I heard they were making no. that. That would be huge news if they were. I don't know if Double mm-hmm. Fine doesn't own the rights to it anymore, but games like that, Psychonauts and Jack and Dexter though, and Banjo-Kazooie, those 3D platforming style games have kind of died off. And even mm-hmm. Mario, the the quintessential platforming game, has gone side-scroller yeah. again. We've broken away from that 3D platforming, and I miss that. But... I, don't, I don't know if Super Mario 3D World was excellent for the... Um... Wii U. That was the 3D game. Yeah, and the one that was on the 3DS was great, but they seem to really be pushing this new Super Mario Brothers side-scrolling stuff. No, I don't yeah. like that. That's, um, I don't know, but um, I wouldn't mind if Crash Bandicoot came back, you know, a proper yeah. one. It, like the old ones. Are there any games currently that use that kind of partnership approach? No, no it's a thing that's died. It really the has. The hero and the sidekick? Yeah. Hmm. Not that I know of. Send it in if you know one, anyone. Yeah. Speaking of that, have we got any more one. emails? Uh, no, that is it for now. The next, the the other email that's in here is for our Final Fantasy VIII show. So, right. um, I have a suggestion, mainly for you, Dan, because you like this style of game. But recently on the PSN, they uh, released a game called Shadow Tower. And it's a PlayStation 1 classic. It is by the creators of Demon Souls, Dark Souls, Bloodborne. But it was right after Kingsfield. So it's kind of their first transition into the style of games that we see now. Okay. But it's I think it's six bucks. So if you'd be willing to spend uh, some money for a game, I think it'd be interesting to go back and see how these games started. See, what I was also going well, to... I'll... I was also going to say, as we should try, is uh, have you heard of Axiom Verge? I've heard of it. It's uh, I think that's just been released on the PSN, and that's um, it's like a kind of 2D game like Metroid uh-huh. with uh, elements where you get new powers and shit as it goes along. Uh-huh. So I think that might be worth a play as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll see what we want to do. I still so. really, really want to do a Red Faction playthrough. I'm going to keep pushing for that at some point but that one we would you can buy on psn for 10 bucks i think so i feel like we could do that after 50 it's a short game it's like it's like it's like a seven hour shooter so Mm -hmm. go from there um yeah if you have anything else you possibly think we would like to play send it in uh i think we're gonna try to do some more videos Maybe today I've got some other stuff to take care of, but uh, yeah. Hopefully, uh, and just everybody uh, give us a review or whatever to follow us on iTunes, whatever yeah, you want. Getting... Send in your e- send in your emails. We could use some more reviews so... on iTunes. That'd be nice. Uh... Yeah, whoever sent the one in last week, thank you. Yes, I appreciate that. It said Dan Dan fits right in with the crew. I was like, yeah. yeah. 
It's like, damn right I do. Because he's just part of the crew <laughs> from the beginning. So. Yeah. I just had a break. I'm back. Yeah. So. All right. That. So, what? Uh, I was just going to say, Jack G in the chat there just said, I would like a good Spyro game. Yeah, I could take or leave Spyro. Uh, I loved Spyro. Spyro Spyro's okay. Loved Spyro. So Jess, much. where can we find you on Twitter? At I am a Jess. Dan. Frosted Sloth. You can follow me at Honest Pizza. That's going to do it for this week. We will be back hopefully Wednesday for Disc 3 of Final Fantasy VIII. And then again next Sunday. We're going strong. I actually just sat down and looked at our record. And from February of last year till we started up with Dan again, we had only released six shows in a, almost a year span. Wow. We have done almost six shows in a month. Holy wow. moly. So we're back in full force. Jesus Christ, you guys sucked. It, well, it was <laughs> so hard with like trying to line up schedules. So I think we found a good time that fits for everybody. Don't jinx yeah. it. There will be, just a heads up, there will be a break in a few weeks. I'm taking a trip back to Wisconsin. I may bring my podcast stuff with me, but probably not. So we might. But I know we had talked about like trying to plan breaks, so then we didn't accidentally do them. Too long. But if they're planned, they sound, yeah, yeah like a week, whatever. We'll let people know. So we will. Uh, a mid-season a break. mid-season break. But that's going to do it for this week. We will see you all next time. Tatty, bye.